morning, everyone, and um, thank you for your generous welcome uh, for me here today, um, and also particularly for the warm welcome to country. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we're meeting today, and in the spirit of reconciliation, pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to thank Anglicare for inviting me here today, um, particularly Dr Chris Jones, uh, Paul Mallett, for, and the Communities for Children management team, particularly Ruth and Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to pay um, particular thanks to my own staff from Faxia, uh, Sharon and Andrew, for being here today. I know they've worked tirelessly to connect well with the community. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Christine Bruce. Um, I'm the Victorian and Tasmanian State Manager for Faxia. Faxia is Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Um, and as many of you would be aware, Faxia aims to support Australian people and families through the provision of both universal support and by a range of targeted services for families and children. And although most Australian families are doing okay in our current society, some are experiencing long-term welfare dependency and social exclusion. The government has a clear agenda around delivering welfare reform to support Australia's most vulnerable and disadvantaged families. And Faxia's family support program pays an important contribution to this agenda. The Communities for Children stream is a key part of the family support program and its core is at creating strong child-friendly communities. Here in Tasmania, we fund three facil facilitating partners to deliver communities for children. The Salvation Army in the South East, Catholic Care Victoria Tasmania or Centre Care in the North West and Anglicare Tasmania here in the North. In total over the three years from 2011 to 2014, Faxia has committed $25 million in funding to Tasmania. And of that, $8.4 million is directed to helping families. By any measure, this is a significant level of funding and goes to show that we're serious about assisting and supporting families now and into the future. The government employs a number of other important tools to inform policy around how to best support families now and into the future. Among these tools is the Stronger, Fa Stronger Families in Australia Longitudinal Study. And this study measures the impact of the Communities for Children initiative um, amongst children, families and communities. The first phase of the study ran from 2006 to 2008 and involved 2,200 families Australia-wide. In that phase, parents were interviewed when their children were aged two, then again when their children were aged three, and again when their child was aged four. Data was collected about children's wellbeing and development, parenting family situation, parenting involvement, and support services in the community. The key findings from this longitudinal study were that families and communities supported by Community for Children Services experience reduced joblessness and better parenting practices than those outside of this support. The second phase of the study is being conducted throughout 2011 and 12. And the results of that will be incredibly important in determining whether the Communities for Children model is effective or not. <coughs> um, more importantly, I guess, is the ongoing evolution of programs and services to make sure that they're providing the support that they need. The Family Support Program uh, views the views of families and service providers about whether the real challenges on the ground are being addressed is incredibly important. And as you're probably aware, on the 10th of October in Hobart, Minister Collins and the Federal Attorney General, Nicola Roxon, launched the discussion paper on future directions for the Family Support Program. The paper heralds the beginning of a comprehensive consultation program across Australia. And I strongly encourage you to read that paper and consider the questions that it asks and offer your views about what it would take to help improve and continually develop programs such as this. The Family Support Program Future Directions pro, uh, paper is available um, on the Faxia website and I encourage you to download it and have a look. Get, in, get involved. It's important that we recognise and build on the good work that's already being done um, and your involvement as providers, community members uh, is important in uh, contributing to that. I particularly commend the collaborative and collegiate approach in evidence here in the Tamar. The Communities for Children Council here in Launceston is a robust forum. It has provided clear direction and advice to Anglicare around the need to improve services for families and the need for innovative approaches in supporting children and families 
across this whole region, stretching from Launceston to Georgetown. An example of the work underway is the development of the Electronic Services Directory that will help families and providers alike keep abreast of organisations and services that are available to them. The project is being developed in re direct response to needs identified by the community. And to my mind, it's this responsiveness to local needs that's a key success of the Communities for Children model. This model has at its core a committee or council comprising of dedicated people seeking to represent the needs of their community and together finding ways to improve service delivery for people and families in their community who are experiencing the greatest need. The council here is a sizeable one and includes representatives from across the community sector, local government and the Tasmanian and Australian governments. And it's a group that represents diverse views and brings together people with a range of experiences and interests to work together to clarify, um, identify and resolve issues. The Council is a forum for positive but robust exchange and encourages real on the ground collaboration at all levels to bring about change. I'd like to congratulate Anglicare Tasmania and the Communities for Children Council for its innovative and extensive efforts in improving collaboration and coordination of services to better support all families in the region. You have a rich array of speakers over the next couple of days to really test your thinking and give you some new ideas to consider. All around the question of whether Launceston can become a Tasmania's first child-friendly city. A child-friendly city is committed to fulfilling children's rights, to inform decisions and express their opinion on the city they want to participate in. As a mother of sons, I look forward to joining you in today's sessions titled The War on Girls and What's Happening to Our Boys. Of course, I wouldn't be doing my job as State Manager of Faxia if I didn't ask that you, over the course of today and tomorrow, challenge yourself about how you can all do more to assist our most vulnerable and disadvantaged groups and their children, including our Indigenous families. I would like to formally open the conference um, and I thank you for your time. Hope you enjoy it. Um, have an open mind and enjoy the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Here we go. Great. Hi. Uh, Wednesday, isn't it? Wednesday. Morning Wednesday. Uh, if you haven't had your coffee yet, then uh, stay awake. Oh, I don't know about that. I'd like to see people for a little while. Uh, I might just put on full for a sec. Is that all right? Okay. Um, great honour to be here and to, uh, and to be speaking uh, with you and surrounded by many of... Uh, many people who I greatly honour and respect. I, I believe I'm bringing tea to China in talking about child-friendly cities here because this community has got such a rich, rich history of, uh, of great joined up work around children. But let me have a go. Uh, talking to Auntie Nola, I realised that uh, in my own research, I, I didn't acknowledge the other uh, traditional custodians of this land, uh, but the Letamarana people. Uh, but I would like to, in my acknowledgement of the Aboriginal people of this land, uh, also acknowledge that my people were convict settlers of the, what's called the Norfolk Plains, a boatload of people who came from Norfolk Island, First Fleet convicts, who settled the Norfolk Plains area and dispossessed uh, the traditional owners. And although my mother said she thinks they're very nice people, I'm sure that we are responsible, uh, my ancestors, as are many of yours, for the dispossession and the harsh reality that Auntie Nola herself was brought up on Cape Barren uh, community uh, because of the dispossession of Tasmanian Aboriginal people from this main island. So I'd like to acknowledge the uh, fact that there's a, such a rich living culture uh, that Aboriginal people continue to teach us and a living culture that says so much to us in the space of children's work in a space that says that elders and grandparents, extended family and past stories of trauma are, are, are rich and present in the work that we're doing with children. I'd like to also acknowledge other elders, non-Aboriginal elders here today and many of them uh, heroes of mine, Dorothy Scott and Peter Kenyon, uh, are two people I've particularly done some fantastic work with and I'm glad to be here to, with them and uh, Steve Bidoff inspired me as a young father 
as he did many other people and elders who I haven't yet met. And uh, Bishop Chris Jones is a, a great leader and someone who uh, has been of a tremendous uh, a role in the life not only of uh, this, this island but of the Anglicare community in general. So acknowledge my elders. And some of them are younger than me. <laughs> what is a child friendly? This is what I'd hope to cover in this, in this time. Uh, what is a child friendly city? Uh, why do we try to create them? Uh, how does social change happen? Let's put this idea of a child friendly city in the broader context of social change. Uh, how many people here are, uh, are familiar with the Ottawa Charter? So for those particularly with a health background and uh, social policy background, so we can, we can briefly contextualise child-friendly cities in, in that context. I'll talk a bit about the Bendigo experience of, of a child-friendly city and, uh, and some of the work we've done. I'll speak also about another small community of 10,000 people called Maryborough, which has got a project called Go Goldfields, which isn't a child-friendly city initiative, but it's, it is the same as so much of the work that you currently do, just by another name. And maybe conclude with some principles about place-based, if I don't get donged before I get there. <coughs> so, context of St Luke's, it's in that other part of Australia, across the bit of water. And St Luke's Anglicare is a independent agency, uh, like Anglicare Tasmania, it has its own board, but it, it operates across the northwest part of Victoria and southern New South Wales. And our focus, some of you will know of our work through the work of our, our training arm in strength-based practice and also our publishing arm in innovative resources. And those wonderful cards that many therapists and counsellors are using in schools, etc. But at the heart of many of our agencies' work and, and, and of the government, government as well, is really an implied message that we're, we're on about social change. And we do that from different perspectives, but it's important just to ponder a bit about how do you get social change? Because not many of us are interested in a long-term strategy that involves more ambulances at bottoms of cliffs. Not many of us are really uh, convinced that we will change the world through <coughs> case practice and one case at a time. They are important, but most of us are really committed to looking at how do we create structural and systems change that complements what we're learning about social problems through our casework. And if we're serious about that, then we have to seriously invest our time. I've got a senior manager who works in our work where we are looking to prevent children coming into placement, who says, I don't understand why we waste so much time on partnerships. And you might think, I've got a management issue. But it is, she's honest enough to be coming from a place where she is so committed to her casework practice that she fails, I believe, to see the energy and the, the capacity that emerges from our joined up work. But she's also honest enough to say that we do waste a lot of energy in our partnership work. It is draining. It robs us sometimes uh, of our capacity to work. When we are sitting in meetings, particularly at an operational level where there's conflict, where we have values that are not shared around the table and we have a language that's not shared, and so we're constantly in a position of rub. We create false dichotomies between the work that we do, between uh, who is the most client-centred, we create language barriers through, through uh, who is the most strength-based, and who's managing risk. So I think my senior manager is, uh, needs some support, uh, but she does reflect a challenge for us in this serious work that we're doing about how are we getting maximum impact for scarce resources. So that work needs to build on science. It needs to build on what lessons we can learn from around the globe. And, and the UNICEF Child Friendly City Framework certainly has something to teach us. So just in, to put into context 
Uh, I, I'm interested in this, this model of social change. How do you get, this was actually a social change model developed by <laughs> philanthropy in the USA that said if, if they've got a finite amount of dollars to spend, how will they get change for their dollars? Will they put all their money in direct service delivery to more casework? Where will they put their investments? And so they basically said that if they are to invest in social change, they need to invest in six areas. The first area is a really simple one. It's name the issue. What are we trying to change? In the world of domestic violence, it was a really important piece of social change work to, to name the battered wife syndrome as domestic violence. That shift led to enormous, uh, enormous change in public perception and in, and in social policy. Direct services are critical and we must invest in them. But we must invest in a way that aligns direct services with the learning that leads that what we know from the direct service leads to, uh, to, to the feedback loop of, of structural change and policy change. Education and public awareness are absolutely fundamental to long-term change and hence we, uh, in Tasmania, you've probably led the way or maybe it's just you happen to have consultants here for the lifestyle, but the work, the un, the, the, a lot of the understanding poverty work is work that's been uh, dr driven um, from some lead consultants here in Tassie, but, uh, but the impact that's having in schools is, is incredible across Australia. Research is, is absolutely fundamental to understanding and uh, we, we, uh, we know that uh, those who, who do that deep analysis uh, based on particularly the data that, that we supply provide a pretty rich conversation for us. Advocacy and the, the kind of work that Anglicare Tasmania is well regarded for but, but so many other uh, uh, organisations and think tanks and universities that really provide the drive for us. Um, the causes, why do we pay our, many of you are members of uh, TASCOS. Uh, we pay because we want to be part of a broader advocacy agenda. And community organising, something we don't do terribly well. We're pretty good at doing conversations between service deliverers and government. We're not very good at investing in conversations in which the community is self-organising to address their own needs and the ability of supporting our citizens and community members to not only speak on their own behalf but to organise on their own behalf. And again, if we had time, we'd talk about the experience in the domestic violence uh, world of, of how that was very much at the heart of major changes in, in the response to domestic violence. It was women becoming self-advocating, creating organisations and creating paths. Unfortunately, sometimes once we become, those services become professionalised, we get in the way of further development of self-organising. And so I thought this was a very insightful framework used by some philanthropists in the, in the USA. But it parallels deeply with the, uh, the charter that, that uh, you, you know about, uh, many of you know about the Ottawa Charter. And although this is uh, often described very much as a health framework, it is a framework for addressing complex social issues or what some now uh, in academia call the wicked problems. So it's looking at uh, building health policy, which means that every aspect of legislation must be looked at through the lens of what's, what gets the best outcome uh, for, the, for those who are vulnerable or the population group you're looking at. It looks at the natural and built environment and says that the uh, creating supportive environments is actually about the built environment and, you, and we'll talk a little bit later about how critical the built environment is in, in child friendly cities and why you need to have mayors and you need to have uh, departments of, of government and local government really integrally involved in putting all of their thinking through the lens of what's best for children. Um, re, the, the notion in the Ottawa Charter of reorienting re health services really is very much about what you're creating here in Tasmania. You joined up government approach, the work that's happening here in Launceston around creating uh, an accord 
uh, creating a, the, the council itself for communities for children is part of reorienting health services and the fact that today is a partnership with Faxia and with the state government and with, uh, and with community organisations is part of what the Ottawa Charter would say is reorienting health services. Victoria's just had a uh, inc has incredible opportunity in the space of vulnerable children at the moment because uh, Dorothy Scott, who you'll hear from uh, fortunately a few times over the next two days, if you're lucky, will, has, has worked with others to develop what's been called in Victoria the Protecting Victoria's Vulnerable Children Inquiry, an extensive thousand page report, I think it is, uh, that we need a wheelbarrow to carry around. But it's, um, it's, it's really investigated what, what does Victoria need to do to move to, uh, to another stage of protecting our vulnerable children. And one of the key recommendations of this, uh, what we call the Cummins Inquiry, is that we must reorient our service systems around area, which brings into question how does a child-friendly city have a role with that. And we must also uh, bring into the tent a much broader group of services. In, in Victoria, our work at the pointy end of, prote of uh, child protection and of family services and the preventative work uh, typically is a bit, it's got some very important um, partnerships, but at the, it also misses a few. Drug and alcohol are not actively engaged. Some of our domestic violence services are not actively engaged at the deep, in the deep DNA level of our partnerships, they're there as colleagues, but not, in, not within the very, very fibre of our partnerships. So we've got some serious work to do on reorienting our health services. Developing personal skills is, is much of what we, we, we do on a day-to-day -day basis in our client work. And, and then um, the strengthening community action is, relates a bit to what I said in the previous slide about how do we support communities to be self-advocating. If we're serious about believing that the client is their own best expert, the community is their own best expert, then how do we seriously as services engage in that conversation? And how do we support citizens to be self-leading? Self so that's the context of this work that we're talking about. We have clearly uh, complex issues to deal with about vulnerability. Uh, we're talking about poverty and let's, uh, I don't think we do enough of naming that poverty is at the very heart of 90% of the work that many of our agencies are doing. And yet our family workers and our youth workers and our mental health workers are not in their DNA, are not daily engaged in conversations about pathways out of poverty. They're daily engaged in conversations about the presenting issue. And so uh, poverty is, you know, at the heart of that is obviously incomes, a critical part of poverty, as well as culture. And the income component, uh, we need a federal conversation, don't we, about income security. Uh, and so that's just an example that complex issues require national, state and, and local solutions. There are many faces to uh, area-based planning, and I'll, I'll be talking about a couple of those. Uh, the, uh, what we've learnt about area-based planning is that leadership is f absolutely critical, that if you're not having the right people at the table, for certain parts of the conversation, we are, we are uh, spinning our wheels. Uh, and also management. We've got to have systems that support area-based planning <clears throat> and the other language that we often use in, in thinking about area-based planning and in the communities for children space and child-friendly cities is this partnership between universal, secondary and tertiary services. And the reality is it's sometimes hard to find enough common energy for our conversations. I don't know about you, but how often do you find a school principal who is willing to engage in the depth of conversation needed and regularly around the table, around vulnerable children. And yet we know that they are the most critical universal service uh, for, for a certain age group. And so whilst it's easy to say what we need is a joined up strategy around universal secondary and tertiary services, 
finding the levers for those conversations and finding the energy for them does take some skill and leadership and structure. Now, what is a child-friendly city? I think that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> Firstly, experience we've had in Bendigo is that child-friendly cities, people love to go to a couple of funny spaces with it. First is they think it's about early years, and it's not. UNICEF defines a child-friendly city as focused on 0 to 18, and for those in in the department and others, you'll know, and others will say 18 is such an arbitrary number as well. Is it really 0 to 25? Uh, depending on developmental issues. But 0 to 18 is the definition of, a, of, of the focus of a child friendly city. And that creates a different conversation, even to the one we're having in communities for children. And a different set of players, but different opportunities. So it is uh, defined by UNICEF as a system of local good governance in fulfilling children's rights. We'll talk about rights in a moment. But it is based on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So how many people here would have the Convention on the Rights of the Child as a poster somewhere in their office? OK. Uh, fantastic. Awesome. Um, and, and then if I was to ask you to recite the Convention, I think it's only got 39 articles, and I think you'd, <laughs> think you'd say pass. What I've found is that the Convention on the Rights of the Child is invisible to most of our staff. What it is, is it, it is an incredibly powerful tool, but it's been unpacked for us. And so many of us will find that it's, it's, it is embedded in legislation, in our, in our children, youth and families, state government legislation, federal legislation. It's embedded in the service standards that, that, you, that you work to. Uh, and it's certainly in Victoria, it's embedded in what's called the best interest uh, practice principles that was in our 2005 Children, Youth and Family Act. So it's, uh, it's there, but it's not pr always present. And I think it's helpful for us sometimes to resurface the, this. It's a bit like occasionally quoting the Bible. Um, in fact, if anyone watched Q&A the other night, uh, it was interesting how often the Bible got quoted uh, in, in, in that debate about uh, how do we treat immigrants. So it's helpful, even if we don't adhere necessarily to a daily Bible reading, it is, it, is, it is certainly helpful to have that knowledge. And I think going back to understanding the foundational material that lies at the heart of our practice is, is important. So it's, it is a global movement, this child-friendly city movement, established by UNICEF and probably established for cities that are very, very different to Launceston. It's, and, you know, UNICEF's charter is clearly global, but a particular focus on, on, on disadvantaged communities. But the communities who, who picked it up strongly, uh, I, I really only know of one that I've studied in detail, and that's London. So London is a child-friendly city, and, is, and if you think of the size of London, it's many, many, many times bigger than Tasmania, uh, <laughs> both almost geographically and certainly population-wise. I mean, so it really begs the question about what is the definition of the size and scope of a child-friendly city? And I'll, I'll raise that as a question for you. And if, by the, by the way, if you happen to get bored, and if you're, if you're already bored, that's fine. If you happen to be bored, uh, I'd suggest you, because uh, this could be death by PowerPoint, uh, <laughs> that you just drift off and think about, if you are wandering down the streets of Launceston or Burnie or... Devonport, or oh, Longford, oh, spare, I'm about running out of names, uh, <laughs> Hobart I've heard of, uh, and, you, and it was a child friendly city, what would you notice? Just drift off and think about what would you be noticing in the built environment, in the interactions, away from the service delivery world that you live in and probably sometimes sleep in, uh, what would we be noticing that says this is a child friendly city? State, city, town. That's for those who are drifting off. For the others, stay with me. <laughs> it's also a challenging name, Child Friendly City, because it is uh, our most 14 year olds don't want to be called a child. I, I haven't met many, except for when it comes to certain rights. 
as they claim. But uh, so we've we've struggled with that. We've used the word child-friendly city in Bendigo. This is uh, probably seems a trivial conversation, but it, it, it does come up. Uh, we've used it because it it connects us to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it's shorter than saying child and youth friendly city. We don't have a good word for naught to 18 year olds. Um, and therefore it does continue to get sometimes drifts to, uh, oh, this is about an early year strategy. So what are some of the rights that, we, that we're talking about when we think about the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Well, fundamental is the child's right to influence the decisions in their city. Mr Mayor? Children's right to influence their decision making in the city, state government legislation, federal government legislation, decisions made at the school, decisions made uh, at the service that they work in. That is a child's right. To express their opinion about what they want. To participate in the social life of the community. To receive basic services. In my town there are probably 200 children aged over 12. We're only a town of 100,000 people. There are 200 children aged over 12 and under 16 who are not enrolled at school. Now their rights are not being met and the state government has got no strategy at all to see that their rights are met. Sure, turn up, enrol at the school, but if you don't turn up, we're going to save all that money. Rights. Walk safely in the streets. Play. The right to play. Embedded, enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. To have green spaces. To live in an unpolluted environment. To participate in cultural events. And uh, so many C4Cs have done incredible work in this area of really ensuring that children participate in their own culture. Uh, their family, culture of origin, uh, and to be an equal citizen in every aspect of the city's life. Now, Bendigo happened to fluke being called Australia's first child-friendly city, and I get to ride on the coattails by <laughs> trips to Tassie. And uh, we were named the first child-friendly city for Australia because a couple of flukes. Firstly, Communities for Children invested in our local government doing uh, a child-friendly city strategy, which included interviewing 500 children, about their, three to eight-year-olds, about their vision for the city. And, uh, and that led to uh, a fair bit of pride in the city's um, behalf about listening to the voice of children, uh, and, but also some, some direct outcomes. Uh, we also... Uh, <laughs> created a strategy of registering shops that were child friendly. So we had a little audit tool that staff could, from the council would go around and, and uh, encourage shops to become child friendly and have toys and have a way in which staff knew how to engage with children. And it was really on the back of those two key initiatives that we uh, flicked off an application to UNICEF and were declared a child friendly city. And uh, that was slightly concerning. In fact, UNICEF has since withdrawn, not our status. <laughs> well, it's no longer on their website. Uh, oh, I didn't tell the organisers that. But, uh, but they have withdrawn a process of registering communities as child-friendly. So if you want to know how to register with UNICEF as a child-friendly city, it's probably not possible at the moment. They're going through a three-year process of reviewing their accreditation for child-friendly cities, so that cities can, um, so that it, it can mean something, and there can be some real hard evidence behind what they're doing. So, for me, the child-friendly city UNICEF framework is very much aspirational. It's around a vision that we want to achieve, whether we're registered or not, doesn't particularly matter. It's what we aspire to be, and what their building blocks are that I find incredibly useful. So the building blocks, there are nine building blocks for a child-friendly city, and if you Google it, you'll find it straight away. Uh, the first is that a child-friendly city must have strategies to listen to the voice of the child. 
And in, in our community, we listen to the voice of the child through a range of strategies and we're only on a journey, but we obviously mentioned the consultative processes. Uh, but we've also ensured that every part of local government, as it's developing its legislation or new planning schemes, it, it does use the, the staff within the children's services to, a section of council to do a child consultation process. They've developed guidelines for how to listen to the voice of the child, but they also have staff to go and do that. And so recently we're, we're investigating a, a simple, simple thing like a playground in our central mall. And, uh, and so the, the staff were able to go out and meet with vulnerable families from the kind of services that St Luke's delivers through to meeting with parents at schools, through to getting every primary school in the town doing a consultation around what playground equipment do we want. It might seem trivial, but when the newspaper regularly publishes the reports of how, what the children are thinking and deciding, it's, uh, it does provide an incredible flavour about a child-friendly city. But children's voice, that's the icing on the cake, what council does, how does that get embedded as a cultural practice across every organisation that's associated with our child-friendly city and with our community. The child-friendly legal framework, so using the voice, but ensuring that the frameworks that are happening both in the city and in local government, uh, sorry, in local government, in, in plans within organisations, strategic plans, trying to find ways to influence the development of every organisation that, has, that touches or connects to the lives of children and families in our community that there is embedded in their planning uh, aspects of children's rights. The children's rights strategy is something, and I've, only, I've put in bold the things that I think we're doing pretty well at, and you'll see that most of them are not bold. The children's, uh, children's rights strategy may well be things uh, like Save the Children, for example, uh, in, in the UK have got a fantastic training program in which they deliver training to workers in the field and teachers about the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Really, really simple, but it's saying that the CROC should li uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child <laughs> should live in the hearts and minds of workers and anybody who's working with children, uh, but also needs to live in the hearts and minds of families. And it's interesting that uh, we, um, in Victoria, I've, I've been advised not to talk about rights. Don't talk about the UN and don't talk about rights when we're advocating to government. Because we have a conservative government, you know, John Howard didn't like the UN, and there's a whole conversation around about why we don't talk about rights. Oh, that, that bothers me, that we're avoiding using language that is powerful and, and goes to the heart of I had my 28-year-old daughter visit. This is an aside while you go to sleep. 28-year-old uh, daughter visited from being overseas for a couple of years last week. And uh, my wife and I sat back after she left saying, what a lovely girl. And uh, how good she is at managing her money because she hasn't asked us for money for at least three years. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we said we did about parenting was that we were patting ourselves on the back, as you do when you get old. Um, <laughs> was that uh, we gave them each a bank account at 13 and we stopped giving them pocket money and just put it straight into the bank. And uh, probably lots of parents do it. It's such a great strategy because you don't have to find money every week. Uh, but it was, we were really clear about saying a regular income stream is your right and it's not going to be connected to how good you are at home or how... Um, or whether you've done chores. Absolutely disconnected from chores or behaviour, uh, that's a different conversation we hold outside of that, but you've just got your money popping up in the bank every week. And um, you've probably all got those, but you know, I was thinking about it, this is a rights embedded strategy that we have as parents because we have an understanding about, it. that's our interpretation of one tiny aspect of rights. You could disagree with me over morning tea. Uh, a child-friendly city has a coordination mechanism and it won't be very different to what you've got here in, already in Launceston and, and in many parts, uh, but it will certainly try to look at a coordination mechanism that's r really embedded in that universal secondary and tertiary service uh, framework and uh, perhaps the Ottawa Convention. How do you engage the built environment people, for example? 
uh, you'll be measuring uh, the impact of, uh, of your legislation and uh, how, how well your children are doing. You'll be looking at a ch the many, the UNICEF says there should be a budget in every uh, part of a child friendly city. Each organisation should have a children's budget, whether it's a small budget for how do we listen to the voice of the child or whether it's local government's budget that's quite discernible. How are we investing in children in our city to make it transparent? We've got a fantastic framework in Victoria called the Municipal Early Years Plans and every local government is expected to have a clear Municipal Early Years Plan about what they're doing for their, uh, for their children across local government. Our local government, to my shame, uh, decided not to have a Municipal Early Year Plan. They said we, we have got children's rights embedded right across the organisation. It was very... Uh, you know, idealistic. We don't need a municipal early year plan because every part of our work has got children's rights embedded in it. In fact, what happened is that children's rights and a focus on children drifted. And a children's budget is one way of keeping it really sharp. A regular city children's report. And uh, this is an incredibly powerful tool. I'm going to talk about this a bit more. That's why it's in bold because we've done this really, really well. So the uh, a child-friendly city should regularly report to the community about how well our children are going. And that public accountability and the power of that, I don't think, can be underestimated. Um, making children's rights known is part of that uh, children's rights strategy, I, I think. And then independent advocacy for children. That so much of our children's rights work is being driven by service providers such as many of us around here. And the question arises, who is standing outside of that asking questions about children's rights who have not got a vested interest in some aspect of service delivery? And, and that's, a, that's an issue we've, we have tried to deal with. So we have a children's rights uh, advocacy group that involves the Community Legal Centre people who really look at everything through a lens of international rights uh, and um, retired people from our sector, um, people from academia who've got nothing to do with, with uh, children's services but have got a lot to do with, with a vision for community. So independent advocacy for children is a really interesting other lens to put on a child friendly city. I think I've said much of that, so I won't dwell on that slide. Ah, yesterday I happened to walk down to our mall where we're planning to put a new children's playground. And here in the mall is Christy, who is one of our children's workers from council, and she's got a T-shirt that says Child Friendly City. I just had to take her picture. <laughs> it is Children's Week, so of course, probably the same here, everywhere. There's lots of things happening in your downtown ac activities, and there was a great game of parents and children playing chess. Uh, but Christie's role is to, as a children's worker, is also to participate in that council's um, consultation process. So whatever part of council is doing its planning, they'll bring Christie in to help participate, skill up their workers on listening to the voice of the child. This is our original vision as a child-friendly city leadership group uh, for Greater Bendigo to be an inclusive community where every child and young person thrives. We wanted to be a an effective change agent as a group. We weren't a service coordination group, and I'll get to that in a minute. The Child Friendly City Leadership Group started out as the advocacy group that I just showed you in the nine pillars. It didn't start out as a service coordination group. <clears throat> so we wanted to be an effective age uh, change agent. We wanted to embed, embed the, the, the notion of children as citizen in, in our thinking. Uh, we, we, of course, wanted every child to be safe, secure, help. Health, happy and healthy and to develop and learn well. So it had a very strong universal flavour. So the work that we did uh, that probably best encapsulates the spirit of Child Friendly City is to create a report and I'm sorry I haven't brought 250 of these along. They, uh, it's simply a colourful A4 20 page report on the state of Bendigo's children and we promised our community that we'll deliver this every two years and uh, it is available on the website if you, if you wanted to look at it. And I'll just give you a bit of an insight into a few of the pages in a minute and the process. 
because I said I think this is a really powerful process to become a child-friendly community. So we wanted to develop a report, even though it's called Children, it's not to 18. What we've learnt about indicator reports, and there's Dorothy could probably tell us a lot more about this, but the way that I remember that Professor Fiona Stanley in West Australia used it very powerfully in the early years about identifying four indicators that the state of Western Australia was going to keep focused on, and birth weight being one of them. But the indicator report creates a really powerful uh, frame for people. It really is, sets uh, a vision. It stimulates investment in children's well-being. It helps us monitor our effectiveness, even though we might only choose a few lead indicators out of the 6,000 that we would all like to see. It prevents children from being forgotten. It garners public support for further investment. It certainly helps put the spotlight on areas where there are gaps. And it makes us publicly accountable. One of the things that drove me to want to be part of a producing this data report was a bit of bitchiness on my behalf. I was concerned that maternal and child health nurses who were run in our part of the world by local government, that their data wasn't publicly available. And that although I knew from other worlds that I'm in, I knew that our involvement in <coughs> maternal and child health visits was quite low for the vulnerable communities that we're working with yet it wasn't a public conversation. And therefore, it's not a public conversation. No one's engaging the broad community in, in problem solving. So we knew that uh, maternal and child health visits in the uh, uh, are one of the most fundamental universal platforms uh, and, and an opportunity for such important early intervention. You all know that. So our visits at first year, the first year of maternal and child health, a one-year visit, we're at... 90, 91% and the three and a half year old visit is down to 62% and we know who the percentage is, we've got a fair idea who's not going uh, and that's our responsibility to share in a solution to that. So making the whole system publicly accountable is I think really important because uh, we'll see that therefore we get to shared solutions. So. Data, and I'm not a data head, but I know intuitively that data is critical. And just a few quotes from people. No data, no problem, no solution. I think that's Professor Frank Overclay, chairs our uh, Victorian Children's Council and uh, paediatrician from our Children's Hospital. What gets measured is what gets managed, and I know that as a CEO. If I regularly ask for the training data about how well our staff are being trained, who hasn't, that really drives the focus of what managers do. So what gets measured is what often gets done. And it sets a vision, as Epic, Epictetus said in 135. Just the final dot point there, I'm not going to speak to this whole page, but the notion of Frank Oberclade and others will talk about it is this notion of progressive universalism, that really if we're wanting to get real responses to vulnerable children and families, that a key strategy is how do we get the universal services to be more progressive in their targeting and their opportunities <coughs> and systems. So, for example, every childcare centre in in our state. Do they have pov understanding poverty training for their workers? Because there are many subtle things that childcare centres do that exclude the most vulnerable. That's not making them a tertiary or a, or a secondary service, that's simply helping them to be progressive in their engagement of vulnerable children and families. We just discovered that uh, many of the families we work with, well, we didn't just discover it, we knew, as you do, that they often, vulnerable families, don't want to come to parenting classes, do they? Is that right? Uh, but what, what so many of our single mothers who we're working with really do want a career and an employment pathway. And so we decided to stop running parenting classes and start running a certificate two in early childhood development in partnership with our local TAFE college. 
And one of the things we learnt most about that experience was we, we, we ran it in a safe environment for vulnerable families. The mums brought their children along. TAFE funded a childcare worker to look after the kids a bit so they could come in and out of the group. Uh, but one of the things we learnt was that the mothers got as much out of watching a childcare worker with their children as they did from the lesson material. And one of the th interesting side, side uh, lessons from that was that mothers said at the end of it, we know we could take our children to childcare now because they're pretty good at looking after children. So one of the barriers to childcare for vulnerable mothers was not trusting others to care for their kids. And that's probably something that was obvious to many of you, but it was, uh, it was a shock to me to learn that. And so uh, we, progressive universalism has got an incredible, is incredibly important to us if we truly be a child-friendly state. And uh, it is about a local response. And we know with what's happening in the UK and what could be happening in Australia and, is, is that we will see much more emphasis on localism, the, the big society kind of agenda, big society, small government. Uh, but, but we do need to find better ways of getting, as uh, Christine said, uh, more effective work at a local level. So how do we do our data report? And I, I do encourage you to have a look at it. The, we, we, we first looked at what data was av uh, uh, available. We provided a bit of a, a huge data, what they call data dictionary about all the data that's currently available in Victoria around vulnerable children and families. Uh, we brought 40, 40 staff from different organisations together to try to create a framework by what were the things that we would want to measure for us to be a truly, uh, to, to, to measure that our children are doing well. And, uh, and we'll, we'll have a look at that framework. So we developed a framework for what are the, what are the domains of measurement. We then developed, uh, a, we looked at the data that was available on the public record that we could that we could pull in at an LGA level, and we had a robust discussion about which data is going to be powerful to lead our conversation and which is just someone's personal uh, pet interest. So, for example, do we have breastfeeding rates? Do we have teenage parenting rates? Do we have school attendance? Um, what's in and what's out? And we tried to be robust enough to say we're going to have no more than twenty indicators. And when you've got youth workers there and, and, and early childhood workers, that's a pretty big ask. So the demands that they created was this ecological approach. So we tried to look at, in the very centre of this ecological map, are children. So we tried to look at data that was around how well our children are going in these five domains, healthy and happy, secure and safe, and they were part of our strategic goals, developing well, active citizenship, that's often missing when we talk just from a service delivery culture. So active citizenship is very much a, a, a UNICEF uh, lens, engaged learning and earning. We also wanted some uh, measures around how families were doing, because if families aren't doing well, clearly children aren't. And then we didn't necessarily create the measures, but we wanted to keep in our, in our mind that how families are doing is also connected to how communities are doing. One of the first sets of data that we used was AEDI data. So the Australian Early Development Index, because it's national, it goes down to a very small level at the at smaller than LGA level. Um, and it's also, um, they gave us $10,000 towards the project. <laughs> uh, that's called asset-based community development, by the way, if you want to put a lens into being opportunistic. It's just using what resources are already in your community. And we had $10,000 to contribute. Uh, we, we wanted to develop a, an indicator report that was attractive um, and, and, and appealed to people in a range of, a range of ways. One of the <laughs> range of ways is that it's nothing like a bit of good competition. So we wanted to show how well Bendigo was doing as opposed to the rest of the state of Victoria. And wherever it's green, Bendigo is slightly better, and wherever it's red, we're worse than the state average. That's powerful. That actually leads, it helps people play with data and unpack data. One of the great frustrations for state governments 
is that they produce data, they do great stuff, and there's no evidence that anyone's using it apart from other government departments. So it's a powerful thing to produce data in a way that you can play with. It's also uh, important that some data uh, has a powerful poetic element to it. The number of people who've quoted to me, Dave, the local councillor came up to me recently and said, Dave, do you realise that only uh, that 20 per cent of our 15 year olds are neither earning nor learning? And he used the language, neither earning nor learning. The power of how we name indicators is quite interesting as an aside. And uh, so we chose uh, clearly as if we had indicators that were connected to the universal service system, we would buy in the universal service system's commitment also to, to these, uh, these important conversations that we should have collectively. We also had data that we couldn't find. The state government said, oh, we have got 150 indicators. We produce them every year. You know, it'll be easy. What we found is that much data wasn't available at a local government level. And so we deliberately printed the data gaps because for us, data is going to be critical. And uh, in, our, in our future as a community, and therefore we wanted to, by pr printing our data gaps, we believe it's helping to maintain the pressure on government to keep investing in generating available data. So that's just another aspect of advocacy, I guess. So what did the data do? Well, uh, it's done a number of things. Firstly, because the Communities for Children was involved from the beginning, Communities for Children has decided to use the state, the Communities for Children in Bendigo has decided to use the state of Bendigo's children report data as a key lens through which they assess projects. So for example, one of the bits of data we put in was playgroups. We said one of the most powerful early intervention strategies is playgroups, supported playgroups, and we wanted to record how many we have in Bendigo and to measure over time the change in supported playgroups. Well, you wouldn't believe the number of submissions communities for children got around wanting to run supported playgroups. And that was a great outcome. Uh, we continue to work with government around the data gaps. Uh, we've had a, another staff, a group have come together to use the results-based accountability framework to respond to eight particular indicators. But probably most importantly, an outcome from the report has been, uh, it's, be, it's brought to the surface the fact that we don't have a good coordinating mechanism as a city. And so you'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about our coordinating mechanism because uh, producing data has led to us needing to create a better service coordination strategy. I'm an advocate of data parties. <laughs> ha has anyone been to a data party? Because <laughs> I, 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 I don't get a lot of invitations. <laughs> and. These staff here would never attend one, by the way. <laughs> they are Sir Luke staff. Uh, but we have universities and, and uh, we have uh, government departments who produce very good data, rich data. And, I've, and the ADI was a classic. I don't know if any of you went to any, any uh, data um, sessions about what the ADI data said about your area. Anyone go to one of those? And uh, what I found was that those people who rolled it out didn't have a clue about how to engage people in having a deep conversation about what does that data mean. So we had one of those and then I asked them to come back again and invite the right people. They invited early childhood. So this is AEDI data, so it's age five, how well are children are going. They invited early childhood staff, they invited schools and uh, they invited a few government people. I didn't get an invite. Ah, I didn't get an invite. That's why that did annoy me. Uh, because I said the service that delivers most services to vulnerable children and families in this town are not invited to a conversation around what the data says, around children's literacy, children's social development at age five. And I just think that's a classic example about why we have, don't have rich conversations around data. 
A, the people who collected it got caught in the detail, and B, they didn't know how to use the data for a creative conversation. So I advocate data parties, and most teams have them. Your team in your work should, will sit together, probably, at the end of each year, look at how did, how did we go, what was the data telling us last year, what are the trends? Simple, simple stuff. We do it intuitively a lot of the time. Have we noticed that we've got a hell of a lot of more single mums coming to our SAP service than we used to have? What's going on? What's our service response? How do you get good success with indicators? I think I've probably spoken enough about that, but uh, you do need a range, a, a good range of people. You need, uh, you need to make sure that at your data parties, data analysis, data, data indicator work, that you have uh, technical experts, community connectors, uh, brokers, and um, and people who are doers, people who know how to make things happen. And it's, there's probably an opportunity for a tool for that to make sure we have the right people in the room. So where to next for Bendigo? Is it up in the air? <laughs> it's a picture from my recent holiday. So, uh... <laughs> so as I said, we started in Bendigo with a child-friendly city leadership group Age, f focused very much on not to 18s, but also focused on advocacy. With Communities for Children funding recently in the last round of funding, uh, again focused on not to 12, uh, uh, we, this, we we funded a project. Communities for Children funded a project to create a services children's services coordination group. And uh, I think here in Launceston, you, you, you're well ahead of this. At the same time, the Victorian State Government started funding a youth services coordination project for youth services in our town for, for services aged for children aged 10 to 25. And so we've brought those two conversations together and uh, are proposing a new structure for our child-friendly city work next year. And uh, you can ignore the bottom. It's uh, uh, someone typed stuff that wasn't really necessary. Uh, but our leadership group is being, is being reconfigured to be a, a, an overarching group, not only for the advocacy, but we're merging the advocacy function with the service coordination function. So the advocacy, the leadership group will continue to, to monitor how well our children are going with the state of Victoria's uh, Bendigo's children report. We'll continue to advocate around embedding CROC in every, oops, in every aspect of our work, uh, but we'll also uh, develop these three other uh, service coordination groups. The early, an early childhood group, which is 0 to, 0 to 12. Uh, maybe it's not early, but anyway, we'll think of a better name for that. A vulnerable youth coordinating group, which is where most of the energy is around vulnerable youth, not, not generalist youth, and then a, youth, a, a, adult, a young adult pathways to tertiary education and employment. So that, that's our new framework for keeping our focus of the community for, uh, child friendly city focused on 0 to, uh, 0 to 18. Maryborough is a beautiful little gold rush town in Victoria that had uh, a huge population in the 1860s uh, and it died. Um, now it's a population of about 8,000. So lovely buildings left, but they've created a, a credible shared uh, community approach to vulnerable children and families called Go Goldfields. It was opportunistic. They developed a, f a model that required a $3 million investment by state government over three years for a little town of 8,000 to address vulner vulnerability. Uh, the state government had a, we had an election. The state government promised money in an election. Uh, when they came to, after the election, they had no money. Uh, and so they funded it out of a regional development fund. So here we've got a vulnerable children's strategy funded because it had an element in it that said it would increase employment. And so it's funded not by uh, human services at all, it's funded by uh, our um, regional development Victoria. But what's, that's opportunism. But it's got an incredible framework. They've got a common set of outcomes that they're aiming for. They've got a common practice framework across the whole community. They've got a data picture. They've got fantastic leadership led by the mayor. It's 
a section 83 committee, which means it's actually a subcommittee of council. Uh, it's got a great mix of go uh, governance mix. I always say that, uh, and Peter Shergold, who was the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet for uh, John Howard, says that the only way to get joined up government approaches is to get uh, non-government people at the table. We've got a very important role to play in the non-government sector to get joined up government. It's be and one of the frames is that we are the honest brokers. Thank you. They've got very clear outcomes around reduction of child protection notifications, improvement of children's literacy, improved community connectedness, and uh, increased uh, breastfeeding rates. That's a legacy from uh, an, another project that they inherited, but it's, it's a positive one for attachment and, uh, and health, um, and improved educational outcomes for young people. But what I've really liked about what they're doing in Go Goldfields is that they're saying every worker across this town who's touching families or connecting to families in some way will, and children, will use these kind of lenses. They'll use a, a, an early intervention lens, they'll use strength-based practice, they'll apply a, the, a, a um, one family, one plan approach, and they're, they're unpacking. What does it mean to train every worker in our community about one family, one plan? Uh, they develop it, they have a community arts lens so they said every intervention that we design will have embedded in it an aspect of community arts. Now, how creative, <laughs> how interesting is that? Uh, and they put an understanding poverty lens, and the one I've missed out is a social connectedness <laughs> lens. So how does every activity we do build social connection for the people we're working with? How does every activity we do apply what we've learned from the understanding poverty framework. That's a great slide I'm not going to talk about, but it's about workers starting to workshop what does one family, one plan for our whole community mean? Joint worker, joint visits, joint worker visits. Fantastic work. I've mentioned already that uh, there that the to get the right kind of planning, we need local knowledge, technical information, and strategic and political knowledge. We have to bring all those three players together. And no one organisation holds all that. We've learned a lot that if you're going to create great governance, and you know this already because you're doing it here, but you know that we have to, you need facilitation and strong leadership. You need strong authorising environment from all the organisations involved, their CEOs, their mayors, others, must be somehow, if they're not at the table, engaged. And you have to have systems. Most of our governance arrangements fall down because someone didn't take the minutes <laughs> and hand out, oh, not most of them, but it is a key, a key issue, is about what systems do you have to maintain the professionalism, integrity, direction. These are only two examples that I've shared with you, the Bendigo Go Goldfields example. Um, I don't know what you'll dream into creation in Launceston. It may be registered as a child-friendly city. It may not. What's, asp what's important is what is the aspiration, the vision that you hold for your future and what science you use to help achieve that and what leadership you can, you can bring. Uh, each of us is leaders and we have to think about how does our leadership, when we're at a forum, we're in a workshop, we're in an operational group of partnership, we have to think about how does our work progress this? Are we there as witnesses or are we there as actors? We do need uh, resolve and we do need to be able to park our egos at the front door when we walk into those places and speak on behalf of our community, not behalf of our organisation. We, uh, when our towns were created, like Malden, uh, like Meribah I showed the picture of, like Bendigo, like Launceston, our towns were not created because of government intervention. Our towns were created because local citizens created a picture. I spoke in the town of Castlemaine, another great gold rush town, a few weeks ago. The town created a botanical gardens before government even thought about that. The town created a theatre, an art gallery. It was local citizens coming together and writing their own script. And we don't need 
to rely on anybody to write the script for our communities. But we do need to have a vision and a hope and our own sense that we are actors in our own communities uh, and we need to write the script to ensure that all our children in every one of our villages thrives. Thank you.